What if we say that an African world war has been going on in an African country for decades? It's the war that has killed over 6 million people, and more than 6 million have been displaced. Would you believe that? Well, it's hard to believe, but the reality is that we are talking about the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country living in a war. People are struggling to live, but the world is simply not interested in resolving the crisis. Even though no crisis or war is less important than the other, the world seems to be concentrated on the Ukraine war and the latest war in Gaza. But what is really going on in Congo? Why is the war never ending, rather escalating and worsening like never before? And why has it remained largely ignored by the world? Let's find that out in this video. Since 1998, a silent war has been going on in Congo, silent in the sense that the world remains largely unaware of it. However, inside Congo, the only reality is this war, with people trying every day to do one thing, survive in any way possible. Congo has become a land of paradoxes because it's blessed with abundant natural resources, but unfortunately, this wealth has mostly been exploited rather than benefiting its people. Even though Congo has extensive reserves of copper, cobalt, gold, diamonds, tin, tantalum, tungsten, oil, and expansive fertile land covering 200 million acres, these resources are more of a curse for Congo. Back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, European powers, especially the King of Belgium, extracted ivory and rubber. Congo became his personal property, which he used to profit from, no matter what brutalities he had to commit. Congolese who did not fulfill their rubber quotes often saw their hands cut off or their families murdered before their eyes. Later, during World War II, uranium from the Belgian Congo played a pivotal role in the United States' efforts to build the first atomic bombs. After gaining independence in 1960, the DRC saw a surge in profitable mining activities, particularly in Katanga province, which led to secession attempts and contributed to the broader Congo crisis. However, independence also brought challenges. The assassination of Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba and subsequent power struggles exacerbated internal divisions. Under the Mobutu era, Joseph Mobutu, who seized power in a coup in 1965, governed with an iron grip for over three decades. His rule was characterized by authoritarianism, corruption, and the systematic plundering of the nation's resources, fueling ethnic tensions and the emergence of armed groups across various regions. Even the 1994 Rwanda genocide profoundly affected the DRC. Extremist Hutus massacred approximately 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus, prompting fleeing perpetrators and millions of Rwandan refugees to seek sanctuary in eastern Congo. This influx destabilized the region and exacerbated ethnic tensions, then started the First Congo War, when rebels, backed by Rwanda and Uganda, sought to oust Mobutu's regime, accusing him of sheltering Rwandan genocide perpetrators. With support from neighboring nations, rebel leader Laurent Désiré Kabila ultimately seized power, renaming the country the Democratic Republic of Congo. However, the Second Congo War began when Rwanda and Uganda turned against Kabila, citing neglect of their security concerns. By supporting rebel factions, they created a tangled web of alliances and conflicts, resulting in millions of deaths and involving various international actors. One of the most noteworthy non-state armed groups in the Eastern DRC is the March 23rd Movement, or M23, primarily composed of ethnic Tutsis. The group's resurgence in 2022 with a major offensive has once again heightened tensions in the region. Despite efforts by regional organizations like the East African Community and Southern African Development Community to broker peace and enforce ceasefires, recent actions by M23 have revived fears of further instability. Of particular concern is M23's apparent goal to seize strategic towns, raising the specter of renewed attacks on Goma, a city with nearly 2 million inhabitants. It's crucial to understand that while M23 operates as a non-state entity, it receives support from the Rwandan government, fueling the ongoing tensions between the DRC and Rwanda. This complex situation underscores the immense challenges in achieving lasting peace and stability in the region. Despite Rwanda's denials, UN experts have presented convincing evidence of Rwandan support for M23. This assistance goes beyond just providing logistical support. It involves supplying arms and, at times, deploying troops to fight alongside the rebels. Recent reports have surfaced alleging that M23 rebels fired what is believed to be a surface-to-air missile from the Rwandan army at a UN observation drone. 
a report by UN experts from the previous year, detailed the objectives of the Rwandan military in the DRC, which include strengthening M23 by supplying troops and materials, securing control over mining sites, and exerting political influence in the DRC. The FDLR, an anti-Rwandan government rebel group operating in the eastern DRC, is considered M23's primary opponent, mostly composed of ethnic Hutus, many of whom fled Rwanda to the DRC after their involvement in the 1994 Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi population. The FDLR has played a significant role in the conflicts in the region. Even if the M23 and FDLR are the major armed groups, more than 100 exist in Congo with their interests, which often means control over Congo. At the same time, foreign powers aim to exploit Congo's vast gold, oil, and coltan reservoirs, a critical mineral for electronics and electric vehicles. Corruption is widespread, with frequent incidents of massacres and sexual violence. In all this, the people of Congo are left under God's mercy. Despite the magnitude of the crisis, humanitarian organizations struggle to draw attention to the suffering of around 100 million people, even though the scale of the situation surpasses that of other conflicts. But how and why is the conflict worsening? Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on Africa's geopolitics, economy, and changing landscape. Let's continue now. Since October last year, the M23 has seized control of major roads leading into Goma, the regional capital, and the hilltops overlooking Sake, located 10 miles to the west. On the opposing side is Congo's army, notorious for its lack of discipline. Even amidst recent fighting near Sake, drunken soldiers were observed recklessly roaming the streets. However, their ranks have been bolstered by two new allies. The first ally is the Wazalendo, a coalition of former rival militias assembled by the government to confront the M23 despite their reputation for internal conflict and brutality. The second ally is a group of approximately 1,000 Romanian mercenaries, many of whom were previously associated with the French Foreign Legion. Deployed around Goma and Sake, these mercenaries are tasked with defending the city against potential M23 raids. Due to M23's increasing violence and awareness of Rwanda behind it, Rwanda and Congo were on the brink of full-scale war in January. It was triggered by Rwanda's missile attack across the border on a Congolese fighter jet landing at Goma Airport. However, the greatest threat now looms over Congolese civilians thrust into yet another cycle of suffering. In the past two months alone, over half a million people have fled their homes, primarily seeking refuge in the makeshift camps burgeoning around Goma. These camps, marked by a multitude of makeshift huts made from sticks and tarpaulins, stretch across plains littered with sharp black lava rocks. Dirty sludge roams between shelters, posing a risk of disease outbreaks. Food is in short supply, with the World Food Program acknowledging its ability to provide for only 2.5 million of the estimated 6.3 million people going to bed hungry each night in eastern Congo. Even the soldiers are grappling with the dire circumstances. At the rundown public hospital in Sake, wounded soldiers lay dozing on filthy mattresses. However, their main concern was food. Doctors confirmed the hospital's inability to provide meals for several days. In a region where firearms hold sway over justice, women are particularly vulnerable. Many from the camps around Goma trek to the nearby Virunga National Park in search of firewood, only to encounter armed men. Often, they are given the option to endure sexual assault or get killed. When the M23 last launched a major offensive a decade ago, the United States led efforts to repel it. President Barack Obama and other officials reduced aid to Rwanda and directly contacted Mr. Kagame to exert pressure. However, this time, Western powers are divided. The United States openly criticizes Rwandan intervention in Congo and recently cut some military support to Rwanda. Yet Britain, whose government seeks to deport asylum seekers to Rwanda, has largely refrained from comment. But why is the world not paying attention to the war in Congo? Well, it's because the conflict in Congo is more complex, involving over 100 armed groups, regional actors, and underlying socio-economic issues. Simply, there is no country, including the United States, that has the capacity to resolve this conflict on its own. And this hinders the international community's capacity to devise effective solutions. Moreover, Congo's abundant mineral resources, like gold, diamonds, and coltan, attract various entities keen on exploiting these riches for economic gain. 
Some nations and corporations may indirectly benefit from the conflict by extracting resources or supporting armed groups to secure access. Investors, miners, traffickers, and the nations receiving these resources are the benefiting side who want the conflict to continue. Moreover, the involvement of neighboring countries such as Rwanda and Uganda further complicates efforts to resolve the conflict. Despite its severity, the conflict in Congo often receives less media coverage than other global crises, resulting in limited public awareness and insufficient pressure for action. Consequently, world leaders may not prioritize resolving the conflict amidst competing geopolitical priorities, such as terrorism and nuclear proliferation, which dominate international agendas and divert attention and resources. Furthermore, the prolonged duration of the conflict and the recurrent humanitarian crises it engenders can lead to compassion fatigue within the international community. Over time, repeated appeals for assistance and intervention face diminishing responses. Additionally, key stakeholders lack the political will to allocate substantial resources or take decisive actions to address the conflict. Political considerations, domestic priorities, and conflicting interests are impeding effective diplomatic engagement and hindering progress toward peace. What do you think? Can the Congo War end if the world wants and takes an interest in ending it? What are your thoughts on why the Congo War is being ignored? In the comments section right below, let us know what if Congo offered resources to countries like the United States. Would the United States resolve the crisis then? Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about, African politics, economy, and increasing power. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned. Tell us what you think in the comment section. Like and share the video, and subscribe so that you don't miss any of our African videos. It's the best way to support us.